our ability to develop resiliency to climate and weather both today and going forward into the 21st century requires place-based information at scales that are usable and actionable for integrated modeling and decision making. Now while most of my effort here today is really going to get at addressing uh, data for climate change adaptation, it is important to take a step back to take a step back and ask ourselves the more immediate question of ac applicability and needs of climate and weather information today. So this issue of applied climate change science deals with, with what I really call the uncertainty cascade and that really forms the basis of the climate scenarios that we'll get into. And so we can think of this as being from kind of a from a top-down perspective, uh, sources of uncertainty coming from emissions, coming from the various ways that GCMs simulate and represent the climate system, and then the ability uh, to translate the output from GCMs at coarse scale resolution down to fine scales again at the at at, at the needs uh, of the scales actionable for end users. So this could be thought of as a as a top down sort of perspective. It could also be framed in terms of looking at what the end users or needs are and then going back and refining uh, the approach that we take. But there are sources of uncertainty in each of the above items. And what I really like to focus on today is uh, the the bottom step here which really pertains to downscaling. So let's really, let's really talk here about the applied use of downscale data. And I, I think it's, it's very much true that not all downscaling methods are suited for answering uh, each individual driving question. So I think there's a matter of sophistication here of, of selecting a method that's best suited for the end user's needs. And so we can think about data needs both in terms of spatial resolution, temporal resolution, the suite of variables that might be needed. Um, we can also think about the um, uncertainty information about the number of models that one might want to use and also the time horizon that one might be interested in looking at uh, a climate change adaptation type question. And then finally, as we start thinking about vulnerability, which is kind of at the core of a lot of the climate change adaptation issues, we can start thinking about the, the types of events that are of interest. So in a number of cases, we're talking about extreme events, whether they be extreme precipitation events um, or extreme um, fire danger type events. And so we can think about sources of, of variability, and these are really probably dealing with weather extremes as well as climate extremes. So getting towards um, higher order climate information. Another important aspect that I think has, has been overlooked to date in terms of the applied use of downscale data is this question of whether we should go with gridded data or point slash station based data. And so there are advantages with both of them. Gridded data is nice because it's spatially and temporally complete. Um, however, it does rely on gridded observations and so there's, a, there's an issue there with the, uh, you know, the quality of gridded data itself. And what I will say is that um, if we are going to go forward and use gridded data, we should be cognizant of the fact is, uh, of if there are biases in our observations, those will uh, be carried through into our downscaled products. So an important caveat there to really look at how well uh, the core set of observations that are being put into uh, downscaled data sets, how well those actually relate to observations. The other alternative is to use point observations. Downscaling to point observations or stations may be useful if current applications are employing station station based approach. Um, there's an additional problem in trying to relate gridded data to station data in that there may be biases. So if we can downscale directly to stations, basically we can eliminate that step. Now one thing that is important to think about with statistical downscaling is data availability and longevity as well as consistency. So station-based data um, may be actually preferable. However, if there are uh, changes in the way the data is recorded through time, uh, that's going to severely uh, limit the ability of these statistics. Downscaling provides a means to translate GCM signals down to the scales usable for applied climate work. Now you may not know it, but there are over six million different ways to downscale climate data. 
of which we don't have time to thoroughly discuss in detail here. And I think the important thing to point out is that while some downscaling methods may be uh, perfectly fine for certain applications, um, other applications may require uh, more advanced downscaling methods. Now, if we were to trap a group of climate scientists, meteorologists, and end users in a room, throw the key away, and have them come up with a wish list for downscaling, you might see something that resembled this list here. Many of these items are clearly met with statistical downscaling and not with dynamical downscaling and vice versa. Now, with these qualities in mind, I think it's important where we can start to explore the spectrum of downscaling methods and ask ourselves the question if these different qualities are being met. And it truly depends on the application of the downscaled data set. So what we're going to do is walk through kind of a spectrum of downscaling methods, starting with statistical downscaling methods and moving on to dynamical downscaling methods. And we'll start with the very, very basic method. Um, and just as a gauge here, we're moving from uh, the type of methods that we can do with a calculator, such as the simple downscaling methods, which basically are just taking into consideration a change in temperature from one period to another period, imposing that on observed climate, and voila, you have future downscale climate data sets. The problem with those very simple change factor type approaches is that they're unable to get at higher order climate statistics. So um, it's problematic when you're really trying to address kind of the low risk, um, high impact climate extremes, and those extremes are inherently tied to impacts. So moving on from that, we can actually start to approach um, more of the downscaling methods that are being used currently. And so in the intermediate category, we're dealing with synthetic statistical downscaling methods that are able to incorporate um, measures of variability. And probably the most frequently used, widely implemented downscaling method is the bias corrected spatial downscaling, or BCSD method. And it's being used by a number of groups um, and implemented by in various forms by groups uh, across the United States. The end products from the BCSD method are primarily monthly temperature and precipitation. Um, and I will just give a kudos and point out that Brandon Moore and Vaughn Walden from the University of Idaho just completed 84 scenarios, and those are posted online at 4 kilometer resolution. So this is a basically a two-step method. The first step is to really um, adjust for biases in the GCM data itself. And so here on the left-hand side, we're looking at a, a distribution of, um, of, of temperature for a, a GCM grid cell. And what we see here in blue are the observations. And so in the dashed black lines is the 20th century from, from the GCM. And clearly we see there's a warm bias in the GCM. So this needs to be adjusted across the entire cumulative distribution function. And after doing so, what we find is basically we're going to force our, uh, our GCM data to adhere to the statistical moments of our observed data set. And we can adjust the 20th century runs uh, using an aligned uh, observational period and then apply those same distributions to our 21st century runs. So we're basically making the assumptions that um, the, the difference or the bias is preserved over time. And so this has been historically done for bias correction on monthly data. However, it can be done on daily time scales. And, and we've done this uh, basically uh, using a, a daily BCSD type method. The second uh, method for the BCSD is the spatial downscaling. And what this method basically does is you have your, your bias corrected GCM data um, that's interpolated to the grid that you're actually being used and then you can basically scale that to your observational field. So this is really uh, an interpolation based approach of, of applying your GCM anomalies, scaling those and then um, including back your original um, observational data sets. Now, there are problems with a BCSD approach, primarily in locations where, there, where regional and local uh, climate fields actually are uh, quite different as you move um, even within a GCM grid cell. And so I've 
We're looking here at a map of uh, precipitation anomalies from uh, January through March of 1995 across the western United States. And I've highlighted here a couple areas. And so we can think of these boxes here as basically representing a GCM grid cell. So this box here in Washington State, as well as here in Colorado. And what you can see is our observations actually show uh, quite a large heterogeneity in precipitation across a single GCM grid cell. And these are actually true features associated with the large scale flow interacting with topography. In an interpolation based approach, you'd feel, see a very, very smooth feature here for your uh, precipitation fields. And so some of the problems with interpolation based approaches is that they assume um, homogeneous climate anomalies. And we know in the Western United States that those are not necessarily always the case.